you for joining us for today's Ipsos webinar, Exploring the Three Requirements for Successful Positioning with the Power to Change Behavior in Healthcare. Today's speakers are Ipsos healthcare experts, and you can read more about them on the slide in front of you. So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Erlene Worrell, a partner with the Ipsos healthcare advisory team. Erlene, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Ellen. Today's webinar is the first in a series that we have planned to address our approach to strategic brand building. This approach has been proven effective with many healthcare clients and helps to build molecules that are in phase two or three clinical trials into the powerful brands they will become. So we wanna share our best practice with you. As you can see on the top row of this diagram, Human-centric exploration is our critical starting point, assessing the market and the competitive landscape, then deeply exploring tensions and unmet needs for key customers, which would include patients, caregivers, healthcare providers, and payers. This deep human understanding then informs strategic decisions on that next row down, including positioning strategy, which will be our focus today. Moving through to commercialization at the bottom, all of this strategic work sets up the healthcare company to launch with excellence and realize the full in-market potential of the new asset by building it into a powerful new brand. For today, we've chosen to lead off with positioning because positioning is the most important of all strategic choices to be made when building a brand. So how do we achieve positioning that has the power to change behavior? Positioning, as we all know, is the place you want to occupy in the hearts and minds of customers. So all aspects of the brand's marketing, communication, and brand experience stem from positioning strategy. But what makes positioning so important is that when done well, positioning has the power to change behavior. If it connects with target customers in a deeply compelling way, people will begin to think and feel differently, and this will drive them to act differently. There are three key requirements for distinct positioning with the power to change behavior, and we will discuss each. Firstly, positioning must be crafted with the primary target in mind. So segmentation and deep customer understanding are required to build positioning that will truly resonate with that primary target. Secondly, effective positioning is human needs driven, and that's what gives it the power to meaningfully connect and ultimately change behavior. Lastly, once it has been crafted and then honed during research, positioning must be pressure tested against strategic filters. Okay, so let's dig into this first requirement, crafted with the primary target in mind. This one can be tricky for marketing decision makers. Who is the primary target? Choosing a segment of the patient population, for example, can feel like leaving something on the table, essentially reducing the size of the market. But we know that trying to be all things to all people means meaningfully connecting with no one. So it has to be done. It's essential that we define the target customer, enabling positioning to then be derived from the unmet needs of that primary target. That's who we're thinking about when we explore unmet human needs in the therapeutic area, also the lens we apply when analyzing the learning. The goal is for positioning to be aspirational to this group. But that doesn't mean we're ignoring our secondary target. Importantly, we also have this target top of mind, wanting to inspire or at least not alienate this group. If patient is primary and physician secondary, we need to understand the physician's own tensions and unmet needs in the therapeutic area. Positioning can focus on the ultimate benefit this treatment will help him deliver to his patients, but then with tailored communication that taps into his own latent unmet needs. This can help make the positioning powerful enough to disrupt the current treatment algorithm and motivate trial with suitable patients. Now, complicating matters in healthcare is the debate around patient versus physician as primary target. In past, pharmaceutical companies tended to focus on physician as prescriber. There has absolutely been a shift to greater patient centricity over time, and I have a lot of heart for patient as primary target, since the patient is the ultimate consumer of healthcare products, of course, but it's not universal. As part of best practice in positioning work, it's important to proactively consider this point and make a strategic decision. While the impulse may be to default to physician as primary target, that may or may not be the right choice. So let's think of examples. 
the complexity and rapidly changing treatment landscape in oncology makes it one candidate for a physician as primary target, especially given the impact on life expectancy from these treatment and sequencing decisions. But even that is shifting with oral treatment options, for example. On the other side of the spectrum, often patient as primary target makes most sense. For example, when patient reported outcomes affect perception of treatment success, as with many uh, mental health conditions, or with chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes, where patient buy-in affects adherence and therefore clinical outcomes. So these are some strategic considerations in the selection of primary and secondary target. Now my colleague Michelle, um, an expert from our qual team, will speak to the approach we take in primary research in order to identify and deeply understand our target for positioning. So here we consider our primary and secondary targets and also that next level down, namely key segments within each. Perfect, thank you, Arlene. We employ a variety of qualitative and quantitative techniques to segment markets with both healthcare professionals and patients. Ipsos generally recommends a three-phase process, exploratory qualitative, then quantitative research to size the segments and prioritize potential targets, and finally, a wraparound qual phase to flesh out the personas. We'll cover our recommendations for this part of brand building in a future webinar, but for our purposes today, we want to reiterate that selecting primary and secondary targets is a crucial precursor to developing a healthy positioning. Once you have identified and potentially sized your primary targets, it's time to consider personas. There are numerous benefits to personas. From bringing your targets to life so your extended stakeholders truly know who they are, to inspiring offerings and communications development. Having personas also allows you and your team to keep your primary targets in the forefront of your mind day to day. So, what goes into creating meaningful personas? Overall, it's a 360 degree approach and view of your primary targets leveraging past quantitative and qualitative insights, as well as potentially synthesis and curation. Ideally, one would workshop personas with the broader team of stakeholders to ensure buy-in and alignment. Once the personas are created, there are a variety of avenues to socialize them, from the traditional infographic and audio or video to more interactive options. You could have actors portray the personas at your next work or invite actual targets to a presentation and interview them live. You could also host an expo with booths for each persona so team members can learn about the personas in a memorable and sticky way. The socialization avenues are endless. After identifying and introducing your primary target, the next step is understanding corresponding opportunity areas. Erlene? Thanks, Michelle. On to the second requirement. We have established our primary target and we have deep human understanding crafted into a persona, as Michelle discussed. Now we build on that foundational understanding by taking a, taking a human needs-driven approach to positioning strategy. We advocate not laddering up the brand pyramid, and with good reason. The problem with laddering up from product features, as many brands have done across all industries historically, is that it takes you to predictable and undifferentiated spaces. Think of all the healthcare brands that talk about freedom from limitations or regaining a sense of control. These are worthwhile goals, certainly, but definitely generic sounding. They don't reflect any true understanding of the life impact in a particular therapeutic area, and they don't tend to connect in a way that will motivate. Rather, we need to take a top-down, human needs-driven approach to positioning. We delve deeply into the tensions and unmet needs of the primary target. So begin by imagining the product as a response to a core need of the target audience. That's the top-down piece. Then explore how to support the brand promise with functional attributes and both emotional and functional benefits bottom up. So of course product features come into play, but we're thinking about how these matter in the context of unmet needs and how they can be framed in a way that the target will care about. These magical areas of overlap unlock powerful opportunities for meaningful differentiated positioning territories. 
The intent is to set up the brand as uniquely positioned to deliver against a core need of the primary target, which then motivates behavior toward the brand. Now back to Michelle again for a look at the qualitative methodologies we employ within this top-down, bottom-up approach. Michelle? As Erlene alluded, we are all on a personal journey to satisfy deeper human motivations. Along the way, we make choices based upon the degree to which the options available resonate. In order to be successful, a brand must resonate with people's deeper human motivations, which is why we advocate a needs-driven methodology for positioning. Even prior to ideating on positioning, there are several methodologies that can be leveraged to gain insight into your primary target's needs. Observation allows us to capture unconscious behaviors and emotions and identify potential contradictions between what people say and what they do. Observation is key to truly understanding compensating behavior, which best represents tensions or unmet needs. Sometimes your targets can't tell you what their unmet needs are because they're already finding ways to work around them. Another human-centric approach is jobs to be done, which is literally a needs framework. Jobs to be done is the progress a person is trying to make in a given circumstance. It's a concept or methodological approach that helps identify innovation and white space opportunities. And finally, one-on-one -on -one in-depth interviews can be capitalized upon to uncover unmet needs. And there are numerous approaches that can be used. Prior to the interview, we could actually have targets document moments in real time through a mobile diary. This is a great alternative if a full ethnography or immersion is not feasible. Alternatively, if we need to understand human motivations, Ipsos's proprietary Syncidium can be leveraged before or during interviews. This validated framework helps us understand the complex world of underlying motivations. Also, during the interview, projective techniques could be leveraged. A plethora of projective techniques exist, but the key is to leverage them to help respondents say the unsayable to help them find a way to communicate difficult to articulate ideas through either words, images, or even sensory items. Finally, again, prior to putting pen to paper for positioning stimuli, empathy programs helps your team walk a mile in your primary target's shoes. Whether this is helping them understand the rapid push and pull of a clinician's day while trying to make complicated treatment decisions, or if this is trying to help them understand what it feels like for a specific consumer target, such as a patient living with a rapidly progressing disease or even a patient at end of life. After we understand the opportunity with a target, it's time to develop and test positioning stimuli. So let's align on what that stimulus is. Ipsos recommends white card stimuli to deeply understand positioning territories with refinement during a qualitative phase to hone for quantitative validation. White cards will be written by an agency with support and collaboration from Ipsos based upon positioning territories identified and agreed upon in the research. Now, it is key to stress that this stimulus is not messaging. Messaging and other communication elements are manifestations of positioning. Also, there are numerous names for positioning stimuli, from themes to premise, promise, proof, to insight, benefit, reason to believe, and so on and so forth. For the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna simply refer to stimuli as white card moving forward. Now, one-on-one -on -one interviews are best to test white cards as we need to understand what resonates with and motivates the individual without any potential group bias. Further, the tensions that are in the premise or the insight may not be something all respondents are comfortable discussing with other physicians or patients. Hence, in-depth interviews are best. 
The interview itself will typically cover three parts. First, an unaided exercise, especially if the team didn't have the opportunity to execute exploratory work early on. Next is the heart and the bulk of the interview, the white card deep dive. And finally, the comparison exercise. Now your market research partner should always tailor any unaided exercises to where you are in the positioning journey and how far along your stimuli is. One possible exercise is positioning Mad Libs, which is useful for products on the market if you wanna understand how your targets view them today, or it's useful after sharing a target product profile to gain your primary target's thoughts and language choice. Based upon Clive David Mann's classic positioning template, positioning Mad Libs is a fun way to complete a traditional positioning framework. The unaided exercise can be as long or as short as needed, but the majority of the interview should focus on the white card deep dive. Ipsos advises sharing the premise alone first to determine if the problem, so to speak, resonates. The respondent's reaction should be to nod their head in agreement saying, yes, that rings true with me. I, I agree with that. After that, we build on the promise. Ideally, the benefit should resolve the problem that was introduced in the premise. Thus, the interview will explore how well, if at all, that benefit solves the tension above it. At this point, prior to showing any proof, we can also explore what type of support is needed to make the benefit credible. Finally, the reasons to believe. Not only do we want to assess how well the proof supports the promise, but also what might be missing. When your primary target includes physicians, Ipsos often recommends keeping the proof for last, since clinicians tend to be drawn to data more so than what they may see in a premise or even a promise. Throughout the evaluation of the premise promise proof, both laddering and behavioral science should be leveraged. Now, it's important to clarify that we are not talking about laddering up from product features. Rather, we're talking about the moderating technique of leveraging Maslow's classic framework for understanding human needs. This is a widely accepted needs model among brand marketers, and it's intuitive and it's useful in its practical marketing application. For example, positioning concepts that ladder higher up tend to be more aspirational and more likely to motivate behavior toward the brand. These are the higher order benefits that are often referenced. As for behavioral science, when integrated throughout the research process, BSI provides deep understanding of the stated and non-conscious goals and motivations of key targets. BSI can provide recommendations on how to optimize the positioning to better align with the target's mindset and ultimately drive behavioral change. Now it's likely that you will be testing a few white cards in research. Thus, after the deep dive, a qualitative comparison activity may be warranted. These comparison exercises can leverage one metric or multiple, as well as non-traditional means as well. If you are evaluating positioning on one key metric, Ipsos does recommend an exercise that captures both absolute and relative performance. Absolute evaluation is how well a stimulus performs overall, regardless of other stimuli tested. It can tell you how close or how far you are from hitting the mark. Now, relative evaluation is how well a stimulus performs relative to the other stimuli being tested. Both are needed to understand the qual performance picture, and you might gather these learnings from a bullseye exercise or a racetrack exercise. If you have two key metrics, perceptual mapping might be appropriate. Essentially, respondents place each positioning on a simple grid based on the degree to which each is, for example, compelling and differentiating. And there are also non-traditional means to understand how your targets are internalizing the positioning, such as an exercise where they draw the prescriber or they draw the user. 
Activities such as this uncover feelings and perceptions that a respondent may not be able to articulate about your positioning. Now, another important comparison that can be done is via quantitative research. Scott? Thanks, Michelle. IPSOS recommends including a quantitative phase to validate the qualitative input for positioning concepts. Our recommended best practices and quantitative research mirrors our qualitative recommendations, where we take both a top-down and bottom-up approach to assess the white cards. IPSOS believes very strongly that a top-down approach should be included in quantitative positioning assessments. One of the ways that we accomplish this is by the liberal use of open-end responses. While the verbatim responses themselves help us to interpret how our customers think and feel about the positioning concepts, we can actually apply quantitative techniques to these open ends. One of the key techniques is using text analysis to conduct sentiment mapping. This approach applies machine learning to understand the networks of comments and themes that are revealed through the open end responses. This shows the connections our customers are making based on the overarching positioning concept. More connections suggests a more powerful positioning. We can take this one step further by employing metaphor analysis. This approach actually uses a projective technique within the context of quantitative research, in this case, visual semiotics. Validated photographs help guide respondents in their open-end responses. And by pairing the metaphor analysis with the sentiment mapping, we can more deeply understand what motivations and unmet needs are being evoked by the concepts. And we can achieve these results without the benefit of a moderator to guide that conversation, representing a more real world reaction to the positioning. Similar to our qualitative recommendations, several of our quant best practices are a combination of top-down and bottom-up assessments. One example is a highlighter exercise where we develop a heat map to understand which specific aspects of the white cards are most motivating and which words and phrases might be confusing, unclear, or that don't quite articulate the premise or promise. We recommend coupling the heat map exercise with more open-end responses, which will help us to flesh out a more robust analysis of what is and is not working in the positioning and why. Another approach that can be both top-down and bottom-up are traditional quantitative metrics to evaluate the positioning concepts. High-level KPI-style metrics allow us to compare reactions among the white card concepts. We can also ask respondents to separately evaluate proof points, understanding which proof points are the most salient to them and which best support the premise and promise in each positioning concept. One of the key benefits of incorporating a quantitative validation phase is the inclusion of normative data. A normative comparison helps answer some significant questions as we work towards pressure testing the positioning concepts. Norms can help us understand which concepts truly rise to the top, even if the absolute scores among the concepts might be similar. Norms can also help us understand if we've identified positioning concepts that are worthy to move forward, Qualitative research alone can help us establish which draft concepts might be the winners, but we might lack an understanding of whether those concepts themselves are good enough to move forward. Normative comparisons can help answer that question. We do caution against using normative data as the be all end all in selecting a winner. Norms should serve as a gut check and an additional diagnostic. In this example below, White cards might seem to be doing a very good job convincing patients to seek information, but there's an underlying issue with their willingness to fill a prescription. Maybe the proof points are hard to believe, not quite on point. Maybe there are some unanswered questions around safety or cost. And perhaps in this case, the HCP will need to do much more heavy lifting to close the gap between the patient ask and their willingness to fill. Norms can reveal a potential issue like this. I'll now turn it back over to Erlene to talk more about how we assess and pressure test the positioning concepts to select one to move forward. Thank you, Scott. 
Uh, let's now consider the last key requirement for positioning with the power to change behavior, namely the application of strategic filters. Our goal here is to activate the learning. At the conclusion of research, we workshop these filters with client teams, harnessing their collective brain power and applying it to the learning, which also ensures alignment. So this third requirement is partly about optimizing the strategic direction and partly about ensuring alignment and buy-in so the client team can move strongly forward to commercialization. The motivating filter is through the lens of the customer and ties quite directly to research learning and the insights uncovered by the methodologies that Michelle and Scott shared. Here, we're pressure testing to confirm degree of resonance and that the positioning concept gets to the heart of what really matters to the target. The benefit generally must strike an emotional chord to motivate the desired behavior change, which may be inspiring patients to ask their doctor about the brand or motivating physicians to disrupt their current prescribing and incorporate this new option into their practice. Next, we filter through the product and brand to assess whether positioning is credible. Is it believable that the brand can deliver the benefit conveyed in the concept based on the data, claims, the reasons to believe? It's about being aspirational, but not going so far as to defy credibility. Connection to the product itself is key here, but branding can certainly enhance credibility in terms of both the brand being created and the corporate brand in some cases where halo effect proves beneficial. The ownable filter has two components. Differentiation is about having a unique value prop and requires a clear point of difference at launch. The ideal situation is when a human needs-based insight, top down, aligns with a product-based point of difference, bottom up, that can strongly support the brand's ability to uniquely deliver against the need. But a product-based point of difference is not required for ownable positioning. Differentiation can be achieved through deep insight enabling a brand to identify and then position against a need and brand promise that has not yet been considered by any competitor. So it's up for grabs. Sustainability is the second piece of ownability and assessing it relies primarily on the business knowledge of the brand team. We facilitate exercises to consider the shifting competitive landscape and any risk it may pose and ways to firmly stake a claim on the chosen positioning. The intent here is to dissuade new entrants from perceiving it as available or vulnerable white space. As we evaluate each strategic filter for each concept, we like to complete a stoplight assessment as you see here. By the end of the strategic filters workshop, we have this snapshot of the team's assessment of strategic viability. Focusing on each filter independently has prevented the need to juggle possibly conflicting considerations and has enabled the kind of rigorous pressure testing that leads to well-informed choices. Of course, part of the strategic assessment at this stage involves optimization. That can often mean deciding upon the concept that will serve as the strategic foundation and then also considering complementary elements from other positioning white cards that were tested. There may be an idea or support point from another of the concepts that fits well with the strongest territory and can strengthen the degree of differentiation, for example, or enhance credibility. This optimization is a key part of the strategic pull through at the conclusion of a positioning project. It's based on the learning, of course, and it's also informed by positioning expertise that enables translation of learning into actionable strategy. At the end, we have an optimized, well understood and defensible strategy that can be embraced not only by the core team, but also by other key stakeholders in the commercialization of this new brand from senior leadership to global affiliates. So that is our approach to developing positioning strategy that has the power to change behavior in healthcare. We hope you have found our perspective helpful. Now I'm just taking a look to see what questions have been sent in. Um, we have a question um, about segmentation. Now, we touched on our approach briefly here as part of our process to achieve effective positioning strategy. Someone has asked, could you tell us a bit more about what you consider to be best practice for segmentation in healthcare? Uh, would you care to comment on that one, please, Scott? Um, sure, I can take a could take a stab at that, Erlene. Um, so, as um, as we mentioned, we'll we'll plan to have a. a an extended webinar about our segmentation best practices in a future date. 
but suffice it to say, we understand that segmentations are often really interesting, but not very actionable. And that's the death knell for a segmentation and a brand team and positioning strategy and so on and so on. So our best practice really at a very high level is to really keep a very strong focus on business objectives and what we want to accomplish, which is to identify that primary and secondary target and to identify them in a way that we can find them in the real world. So on the HCP side, that means um, merging attitudinal with behavioral data so that you can tag a target list so that sales teams and um, like omni-channel teams can find them. On the patient side, it means, you know, while we all love attitudinal segmentations, it can't just be attitudes. There has to be something that's behavioral or clinical or demographic so that you can actually find them in the real world. So that's really the at the heart of our best practice is making sure that we're focusing on something that's not just interesting, but actionable. Thank you, Scott. That's great. Uh, now, another question. Um, how do we get from positioning strategy to messaging? What's next? Would you like to take this one, Michelle? Sure. So the first thing I will say is it is absolutely crucial that your positioning is firm before you start working on your messaging or creative development, whatever is coming next. The reason being is, as I mentioned earlier, messaging is a manifestation of your positioning. So if your positioning is not set, you're not quite sure what you should be messaging yet. When you are ready to test messaging, oftentimes we recommend a workshop between the two phases, between positioning and messaging. The reason being, you can ensure that all of your stakeholders are bought into your positioning, and it also allows you to discuss some of the key questions that you need to consider with messaging. Things along the lines of, are you going to have disease state education as either a phase or a set of messages? What internal and external sources are you going to pull from for the messaging, as well as the goals of the messaging itself? When it comes to methodology, after the workshop, oftentimes we recommend first a, a qualitative phase that enables you to optimize and refine messages. It also often lets you cut down the number of messages that you may be testing. And then of course we go into a quantitative phase. Uh, most often for quant, we recommend either something like Max Diff or Turf with Story Builder. Erling, did that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think it, it did a great job of it. Thanks, Michelle. Now, I have another one for you, if you're okay, and it uh, looks like we're fine for time. We have a question. Uh, you raised Sensidium, Michelle, and uh, there's a question. Please elaborate on Sensidium. Absolutely, and Scott will help me with this, of course. Okay. So, yes. Sensidium is Ipsos's proprietary framework that helps uncover underlying human motivations. So it is a globally validated framework that we can use both qualitatively and quantitatively. What it does is it essentially uses two different axes to help us understand what is truly driving human motivation. Um, and it takes into account different aspects of psychology to do so. Scott, what would you add to that? Um, I would probably go way too deep into the weeds to talk about how it's based on like Freud and Adler and the orientation between you know, yourself and others and um, and yeah, but you you gave the the high level. It's a way to really uncover motivations um, using a lot of projective techniques. Um, yes. and it's something that can be tied into behavioral things as well. So it's not just, again, we want it to be actionable. So. Great. Thank you both. There's also a question I see here about our normative database, which you mentioned, Scott. The question is, is your normative database composed of all positionings tested or only successful positionings as demonstrated by brand performance? Oh, wow. That is a really great question. Um, it's got everything in it, the the winners, the clunkers. Um, we tend to not have a lot that are bad because ordinarily, if if we have a, a good thorough qualitative phase, things you were kind of really 
kind of picking away between two or three concepts that are like equally strong. But there are times when, and I mentioned this when I was talking earlier, where we might identify kind of the best three concepts out of qualitative, but in reality, none of them are really great. So the, the database, and we've got, um, you know, I know other suppliers have databases. Our database has literally hundreds of concepts in the US, pharma specific for patients and physicians, um, as well as a global database. Um, it's got them running anywhere from the the superstars to the duds, um, and they're all in there because we really do want to understand. Like the example that we had, it might be really great on some metrics, but you might have something that's falling down on others. So it's a good question, mm -hmm. though. Great, thank you, Scott. Good answer too. Um, I do see just one more question at this point. Um, it mentions you noted that this is just one in a planned series of webinars. What others are you planning? Um, let me comment here, and it's a great segue to the next slide, in fact, if we could go to that, please. Um, so here again is the approach we take at Ipsos to building a molecule uh, into a powerful new brand. We covered a key piece today, uh, and that's on the brand strategy role, positioning. And of course, there are numerous steps ahead of positioning, so we touched on those briefly as well today. But we had talked internally about segmentation warranting a deeper dive. We also had that question, so that seems to support the thought that we should do more on, on segmentation. So stay tuned for more on that. Um, and this piece connects to personas or target customer profiles, as we call it here, right? Um, I'd also like to delve into uh, the one you see here, condition experience and strategic moments. Um, on the top row, which is essentially the patient journey with a particular condition. Uh, this encompasses both the transactional side or patient flow, as well as that emotional lived experience in a particular therapeutic area. And the intent is to identify where those tensions and unmet needs reside, right? Where there's opportunity for intervention that can in fact optimize the trajectory of that journey with that therapeutic area, which would improve the patient experience um, ultimately, often also the experience of healthcare professionals who are treating that particular condition and the loved ones of patients, right? All while realizing business opportunity for, the, uh, for a suitable treatment. So journey is definitely a place we'd probably go. Um, on that top row, if we think about some of the foundational work, market mapping, mapping and competitive assessment, those might make another good session. And there's always interest in market access, <laughs> a tricky area. Um, so we have ideas in development. And I just want to mention that we're certainly open to suggestions. So please feel free to reach out via the email addresses that you'll see in the presentation deck um, or on LinkedIn. We'd be pleased to hear from you. Um, so, any final comments, uh, Michelle or Scott? No? no? Then that appears to be all the questions. So then back to you to wrap up, please, Alan. Wow, um, I just really want to thank the, um, Erlene, Michelle and Scott, the team here for today's really uh, deep, interesting discussion. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. If we um, have any further questions, we can answer those by email. So do please reach out to us at any um, time. We welcome the opportunity to speak with you. That now concludes today's Ipsos webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.